you're listening to This Year in History. I'm Marissa. And I'm Jordan. Today's topic will be the year 1902. And what are you starting us off with today, Jordan? Today I will be talking about the first movie theater that we know of in history. And it was called the Electric Theater in Los Angeles, conveniently. It was opened by a man named Thomas Talley. Now, Thomas Lincoln Talley was born in Rockport, Texas in the year 1861. He actually, you know, we're both in San Antonio. He actually, before he went to L.A., he opened up a phonograph parlor, which is kind of like a, an old record recording type of place. Oh, where it has like the, um, like the tunnel. <laughs> it looks like a tunnel. What would you call it? The horn. It's like a horn. What do you call that thing? Yeah. It's like a brass horn. Yeah, and you like speak into it or you would hear from it. Or like, like when you watch an, uh, a movie that is depicting like old times, people would use that for their ear to hear. Yeah. And they'd, okay. they'd wind it up with the hand. <laughs> yeah. 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 So he had a phonograph parlor, which is kind of like it's a bunch of phonographs in one room. And people go in there and use it to record, to speak. It seemed very interesting. So he had that in San Antonio in 1890. And then that's the same year he went to L.A. to further his businesses. And he bought out this theater and renamed it the Electric Theater. What's the what's the the history behind the name? Just I, I, I try to look up why they called it the Electric Theater. I didn't find anything on that. But... I'm assuming because it went from a stage live action theater to electricity. And back Mm -hmm. then, if you put the word electric in something, it was like, oh, shit, this is valuable, Mm -hmm. you know, because it was like pretty much the beginning of the the electric revolution. Would you call it that? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Do we have an electric revolution? What do you call that? Anyway, there was industrial revolution before that. And then electricity and everything started becoming electric. People went from candles to light bulbs. And yeah, so he had a theater. And you know what's very interesting about that year too, 1902? Have you ever heard of, it's a French film. It's called like A Visit to the Moon. I think it's the name of it. Let me look it up really quick. Do you know the Smashing Pumpkins? Yeah, I know who they are. Yeah. Yeah, they have like their artwork. Remember that movie, that not movie, the uh, the album, the big album. They have uh, Melancholy and the Infinite Sadness. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Do you remember the album art? Like all that weird like stars and like cherubs mm-hmm. and... Anyway, that is all based off of this old film that was released in 1902 in France. I'm now seeing it. It's called Trip to the Moon by George. I'm not sure how you pronounce his French last name. Millies or Millies. Yeah, he presented it in 1902. Just a little bit of trivia to add on to that. So that it's the beginning of silent films, silent film era. It wasn't until about 1905 is when it really caught on nationwide and worldwide where people started using going into the going to the cinema. So he he kind of started revolutionized a movie theater. And it was very tiny, very small. He it only could fit so many people and later on in 1905 he bought out another theater and expanded from there. So you didn't have many theaters to choose from back then or not even just many theaters, many films. But if you look at the trip to the moon, it's really good. Oh, you've seen it? Yeah, oh, it's, okay. it's on you can find it on YouTube. It's about 13 minutes long. It's really well done. Choreography and you can tell they did angles and lighting. So it's like a three-dimensional stage they built. And they have a camera fix. So from that perspective of the camera, it looks really good. You know, you probably couldn't pull that off in an actual theater because you've got people who are sitting from different angles. So to give the illusion of that depth, you would have to have one camera angle. So it was really well done. You could tell it was like done like a play. Like they rehearsed it, the movements, were the placements. They had, they had special effects, everything. Now, of course, it's before they could record sound onto it. So that's when you would go to the theater and it'd be some guy playing the piano along with the, you know, in the front of the theater (laughs) with, of course, like dialogue typed onto the uh, or text on the screen. So I'm sure you've seen a silent film before. Mm -hmm, Yeah. Yeah. So and also I wanted to mention, too, he also the, the first two people he ever signed was actually Charlie Chaplin and Mary Pickard, or Pickford, mm. sorry. He signed them in 1912 so for the first movie contract. And he also founded the first movie company called First National Pictures, which is a very good name for a company that is the first national picture. So he's very really revolutionized movies and everybody watches movies, everybody's streaming TV shows and stuff, and it's all because of him. But maybe he wasn't the only one. I'm, I'm sure like motion pictures were a thing before this, but he actually had the first public theater where people could pay and come and see a movie. 
Okay. And he was only showing moving pictures, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's only, as we call now, motion pictures. Mm-hmm. I would assume eight millimeter. But, you know, another little bit of trivia is this was in 1902. Exactly 100 years later would be my first time being a full time projectionist. So I've had some experience working with film, did it for about eight years. You worked with me in one of them, I think, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah I, I did. forgot about that. I nearly forgot about that. I know you didn't work with me in the first theater I worked at, but later on. Uh, what was the first theater you worked at? I thought it was, it was where Westlake's. We yeah, I worked there. But not when I worked there. Oh, no? No. Hmm. Yeah, you came. I saw you visit, but you didn't. You didn't work there. <laughs> okay. All right. You worked at the, the other theater I worked at, Northwest. A little bit of trivia. Oh, that's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you must have quit or got fired before I got there. <laughs> Ooh, we'll never know which one. We'll never know. Yeah. I found that very interesting. Just, um, I mean, I, I have a love for film and theater. I like that we have digital now because we won't have to worry mm-hmm. about the, the problems that <laughs> uh, film has. But I mean, it lasted a solid hundred years, you know, so, it wasn't until so about 2007 we started going digital. I remember when, yeah, when you work there, you actually had to like splice the film together. Yeah. And if people messed up, you get dust on the on the picture. You would get uh, scratches. We mm-hmm. had a thing called brain wraps. Remember those where the film catches yeah. on fire? Yeah. <laughs> You're just watching a movie and it just melts. <laughs> <laughs> and it goes. And yeah. so now they just put a disc in and then that's it. It's more like a hard drive. Yeah. So it's on okay. this big hard drive. They slide in and plug into the theater side of the projector. But um, so pretty much film is dead. There's a few art houses holding it up. But um, I mean, it had a solid hundred year run you know and i remember the big cases they would come in and then pe- they would come pick them up when the movie was already done being in theaters right yeah yeah so we had like typically about six reels mm-hmm. you fit about 15 12 15 minutes on each reel so typical typical movie is about an hour 45 minutes roughly yeah they fit on six reels and you know i used reel to reel projectors back in the day 2001 actually when i was training i was looking over someone's shoulder as they were a projectionist and it wasn't until 2002 i used platter systems where you put all of the reels onto one, put them all together. So it's more like a cassette tape and it plays out and then plays back onto another platter. So if you can imagine a cassette tape, cut it in half, like take take the two reels, put one on a table above and one below, and you're feeding the film from the center of the tape rather than the side or the edge. There's a lot like that. I really enjoyed it. And um, I think it's why I've drawn to this topic because I have a sentimental connection with film and theater. Sad to see it go, but... um. Yeah, like I said, it lasted a solid hundred years. And you look at films from the 30s and 40s and you watch it on TV and it holds up. Like the picture quality is amazing because mm-hmm. they use film. Now, if they use some sort of electronic, you know, like like set tape or something like that, you're not going to get that quality. So film in both photography and in motion pictures really had the best quality for a good hundred years. I mean, you could take something that was eight millimeters or... 35 millimeters and project onto a 40 foot screen and the picture looks amazing it's like really sharp but the reason why i was saying i'm glad we're in the digital age is because you don't have those out of focus problems you had before not not to the extreme digital is pretty much uh the best sound and picture quality you're going to get now but there was a time maybe 15 20 years ago where you could not compare to film film was just by far much better a better picture a better sound well the sound has always been kind of better digital in the past 15 20 years actually ever since 1992 or 1994 i think it's 1992 or 1994 they came out dolby digital which was for sound and we had like the dolby stereo 92 is when we had dolby stereo and then it was about 95 i believe when we had dolby digital we got that surround do you remember when we, we used to play like DTS, like that's called digital theater systems. Mm-hmm. And the actual film had a soundtrack. Like it had like a literal soundtrack. That's why movie soundtracks are called that because it's like the, the, f- the music from the movie. So it was, it was a little laser that read the sound, which I thought was amazing. It would, it would pick it up in Dolby Stereo, Dolby Digital. Mm-hmm. And then we had DTS and the other Dolby Digital discs where... It was playing off a CD and the barcode on the film actually told the CD where to be. So it would sync it up. 
So the audio you were hearing was actually coming out of a CD. That's why I got a really good quality audio. But the film had a barcode on it where it could the laser would read where in, in the CD it should be. So it'd sync it up perfectly. Yeah, that's crazy. You don't really think about what goes into when you when you go in to watch to watch a movie in a yeah. movie theater, you don't go into what the setup is. And I think since we're going through currently going through the COVID pandemic and movie theaters have been closed, um I think we're going to start to move away from that. I think because, so. Because um, Trolls, the there was a movie, what is it? The Trolls Wor- World Tour that recently oh, yeah. came out. So it went straight to, I think, like Amazon to where you could rent it. And they actually made more money in the three weeks that the first three weeks that they released it than they made in five months from the first movie in being in theaters. And um, I also heard that AMC was probably going to close down, like, forever and that's the theater i used to work at yeah so um there's an article i'm looking at right now inside the magic uh dot net and they have an article talking about how they might just they might not be able to financially recover which is a popular term these days from this covid19 pandemic i nearly said global pandemic but that would be like saying atm machine Mm -hmm. (laughs) they've lost a lot of money Uh, one weekend they lost 149 million they're losing a lot of money and so unless they get creative now even when I was working in the theaters, I remember there's a they would do different things. Like they would have, for instance, like they would do things a little bit differently. Like they would have creative ways to get people to come to the theater, such as game competitions. Because of digital theaters, they can hook up like an Xbox or a PlayStation to the projector, and they would have game competitions, or they would have live streamings of a soccer game. The- or the football games, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They would have it like, you know, like boxing matches or whatever where they can run it and then also charge tickets and then people can come in and watch it. So they had exclusive events, special or, events um, for streaming. Drive-ins might also make a comeback since, you Yeah. Know, I love the drive-in. Yeah, I love the drive-in too. I had, I remember like when we worked for the, the company Santicos, which is a San Antonio local company here, we had a drive-in theater. And I remember. Yeah, mm-hmm. and we would get free movies. Pretty much a carload of people. We pull up, and I had a very because I always had like a subwoofer or like a system or whatever. And we played the <laughs> the uh, sound out of our own car speakers. Mm-hmm. Anyway, long story short, I would pretty much frame my windshield so when I reclined my seat, that the screen would fill up my entire windshield. And I went as far <laughs> as even taking off my rearview mirror, just so I could see that little bit. And there'd be like that little um, piece that holds the rearview mirror there. But that was it. But really, like, I, I try to get the experience. But it was kind of shitty when it was hot because then you wanted to roll your window down and then you would hear everyone else playing the music really loud, like being obnoxious, people with the headlights on the screen mm-hmm. or people just talking and laughing. And then you get mosquitoes coming in. So I found <laughs> out <laughs> the best time to go was like November, December, January, February. Yeah. <laughs> and so I, I just went around that time of year and I'd order a pizza and have a pizza in the car and. Yeah, it was a good time. So I really hope that they do come back. And now they could probably do it from an app where you hear the sound from your phone instead of having your car on. For sure, yeah. And you can Bluetooth yeah. it to your car mm-hmm. even. Yeah, or even have headphones in. Yeah, you're right. Like if you could just Oh yeah, headphones. You could just like plug them in and like you just hear Yeah. That's well, a good I mean idea. like like from your phone. If you had the app the pl- like Yeah, yeah, you plug it into your phone and you you're just you know, so like the sounds from the other cars wouldn't yeah, and you could play it out of your car you. or you could just play it out of headphones if you want to save your battery. Because, mm-hmm. yeah, I, I loved it because I had like a, you know, an amp and a subwoofer and I would get like the movie experience. You get that, <laughs> or that all that, all the explosions and stuff I would hear from my subwoofer. And I still have a DVD player in my car now. So sometimes if I'm waiting at work, I'll play a DVD and have it, you know, in the surround works pretty well, too, surprisingly, even in the car. That's my story. Uh, yeah. The Electric Theater in L.A. 1902. It opened April 16th, 1902. That's my story. <laughs> That's a good story. All righty. So moving on to what I'm going to be talking about. Um, if you had to guess before today, when did you when did you think the first wireless telephone was created or actually able to use a wireless telephone? Wireless? Um if I had to guess, I'd probably say 1978. Me too. I thought it was in the 70s, you know, when they would carry around like a big suitcase. Yeah, yeah. The big, I mean? That's what I, exactly what I was thinking about. Thinking about those old, those old attorneys from New York that had that. Yeah, it was a briefcase and they opened it up and they <laughs> yeah. bragged about it like you were the shit if yeah. you had that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I thought that too. So 
when I was doing research for what to cover for the year 1902, I was shocked that somebody had done it actually 1902. He had actually, the, um, the person who actually made the first wireless telephone or at least showcased it in America was in 1902. And he was Nathan Beverly Stubblefield. He's from Kentucky. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And um, at first I was just like, but is it weird, really wireless? Like, you know how some people like they'll label yeah. something and it's not like they'll say, oh, this clock from Egyptian times. And it doesn't even like really represent anything that looks like a clock today or at least in modern history. <laughs> yeah, good. I know we've had like radio phones yeah. like World War Two. You know, they had like these uh, radio phones where it was like some guy with a backpack with a big antenna. But it was just basically a radio phone. You had to be within reach. But telephone is different. What kind of technology they use, you know? That's what I'm going to get into because it's very interesting because I was just like, I can't believe I've never heard of this. And um, he actually uh, he actually was able to get it to work, I think, at least like 17 years before 1902. Yeah. But he didn't actually showcase it until January 1st. Oh, wow. And. Yeah, because he was still working on it because he was trying to find a way to make a telephone that didn't um, infringe on the patent that Alexander Bell had for like the wires, Mm -hmm. wire telephone. You know how when you. Yeah, yeah. You have to have a line. Yeah, your voice is transmitted through the poles and the wires. So he was trying to find a way to do that without infringing on that patent. And he found one. And what he actually did, he plugged in two rods into the earth. And then connected those rods into a large battery, which was about the size of a trash can today, or maybe even like a a clothes hamper. Okay. And then the electrical current through the earth actually went through the rod and charged the battery. And then somebody who is maybe at least up to half a mile away would plug in their rods and have their receiver connected to the big battery and they could hear him speaking. Wow. So he was using the electrical current through the earth to get, you know, to talk to people. That's amazing. Yeah, isn't it? I was like, that is so fu- that is so incredible. And but he he at the he was only able to get it up to half a mile, but he was very um, optimistic on what his invention, the improvements that could come from that invention. Yeah. And he had um, ideas of like putting it on a boat or um, a train, like moving vehicles where it doesn't doesn't have to be, you know, just in one position. So he was able to do that. And um. He, he showcased it on January 1st and the newspapers came out and then he went to D.C. And and then the a, a company called the Wireless Company of America took interest and was telling him, you know, we'll give you this much in stocks if like you give us the patent so we could, you know, make this commercialized. Mm-hmm. But then it turned out that that was just a scheme. So all those stocks that they had given him were worthless because when he got to New York to showcase his um his invention, he was in Battery Park and he couldn't get a signal very good when he put in the rods. And it was because of other types of electrical current going through Battery Park. And there was like just so much going on. It's New York even at that time. And so he couldn't get a good signal on him. He was telling the guy we got to move. the. He was telling one of the, the guys from the Wireless of America, we got to move the site because, you know, this soil isn't good. I'm not getting a good uh, current to showcase them uh, my telephone. And the guy was like, well, just plug in a wire. Nobody has to know. And he was like, no, I'll know. And so, like, he packed up his stuff and left. But, you know, since nothing came of it, he lost those rights to, to that invention. So, yeah, I was just going to ask you. So why didn't that catch on opposed to the way? Because even today, we still use landlines, like offices and stuff like that. It's not very popular, but it's still being used. So you think if there's something that was wireless. That you could use the uh, electrical current from the earth. Exactly. Yeah, that's, that's what I thought. Because I was like, this is like amazing. Like, why didn't anything come of this? And it's just when you have powerhouses like Alexander Bell, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like in order for that to happen, you have to take down somebody as large as the Bell Company when they already have their their line set up. And they're expanding rapidly across the nation with the, with that. And, you know, to bring that down and, and bring in your competition, you're going to need to have money behind you. And he was a poor farmer. And the people that came to help him weren't interested in actually in the invention. They were interested in scamming people and taking investors' money. Yeah. And he, and much like Nikola Tesla, he died poor and alone. And I think he actually starved <laughs> to death. They always add a loan. <laughs> Just a- Huh? They always add a loan just to kick him in the down. 
Yeah, but well, because his family left him because he had a farm and um he kind of let his farm go like he wasn't taking care of it because he was so invested in in his creation and he thought this was a way to make money. But after it fell through and his farm was like done for, his family left him and he ended up just alone. So what what happened to the people that took his patent? Did they use do anything with it? No, they didn't. They actually signed. There was somebody else, I think, who was also in trying to invent something similar to what um, Stubblefield was working on. And they actually invested in him. But I don't think anything ever came of it. Oh, but it, it's, it's strange because I, I wish I could like peek in through a timeline where inventions like like Nathan Stubblefield's wireless telephone and Nikola Tesla giving energy just from free energy yeah. like i wish i could see in a timeline where inven- inventions like that were encouraged and not stifled like to see where technology went mm-hmm. if people actually invest invested and took time to like create those type those type of technologies it, it's just it's funny because it's, it's all about money and mm-hmm. patents and stuff like that and that's where it's that's where it gets tricky like because we don't have the freedom to explore different ways of communication and energy because of patents and people getting sued and you know, people losing their farms and their houses and families. Even today, you can't just get go and get a um, a solar panel for your house. And when you do, you have to go through all these laws and it's expensive. And if you live in a certain mm-hmm. part of the town, you can't do it. You can't collect rainwater. You can't, uh, there's so much you can't do because of regulations. And still oil has so much power in this country where people are afraid to try different exports. And then also you, you need to have a lot of, you have to have a lot of money to... Uh you know to create a patent. pay for yeah or to pay for all the the tests that you need to do yeah you know what i'm saying so yeah. it's not like um me and you could go out and do it yeah so but but what he created he called it an earth battery and i don't know if anybody ever figured out how it worked that that thing that i said was the size of a trash can yeah so that big battery would um would like hold the uh the electricity can, um that the rods got from from inside the earth. Mm-hmm. So I, I thought that was really interesting. I was like, why isn't that like we could be powering our stuff today with stuff like that? <laughs> like, yeah. why do I need to pay the electricity company? <laughs> We're paying a lot for the electricity company. Um, And it's all oil based. And yeah, even like where we live, we have CPS and mm-hmm. they have the monopoly on all of electric and gas. There's no competition yeah. here. So. If you are a uh, energy company, come to San Antonio so we can get these prices down because they're greedy here. And or monopoly, uh, if yeah. you have an Earth battery, yeah. Well, <laughs> I wonder if it. I wonder if it's because of the interference is why it didn't work so well. Because if you go to a crowded place like New York, it's, it could be a lot more interference than where he was mm-hmm. in the farmland. Yeah, and and he said that that it depends. Like he he used to call it good soil. So I think it did depend on which parts of the of the United States, yeah. United States, that it could work. But but he said that he was like, he was really excited. Like, I mean, it's he said the possibilities are are limitless. So, you know, he wasn't just he wasn't just content with what it was at that time. He wanted to build more from it. Yeah, that'd be an interesting experiment because we, we could pick up power from a potato and you get those little, I don't know what you call them that read the energy levels when you get those two little um, spikes on a wire and you stick it into a potato and, and you have that thing that reads the uh, numbers. I know nothing of what I'm talking about. I've just seen it happen. <laughs> it's like I haven't seen it since like elementary school. Primary yeah, somebody, school. somebody actually uh, did an experiment in 2010. Yeah, yeah, they they connected a microphone to a battery and to those rods and put the rods inside the earth and then they uh, and then they put. They put uh, t- three sets of rods in other locations with the receiver, and they were able they were they were able to hear the person talking through the microphone. Hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, you know. And, what, sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I was gonna say like you ever gone to like those space museums where they have like those giant satellites that are far apart, and you just speak to it like normal, like how we're speaking now, and you can mm-hmm. hear them from across the way. Like there's one in Alamogordo, um, New Mexico. And it's at the space station. I don't know what they call it there. Animal Gordo Space Station. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, that one near White Sands. And they have these two big satellites and they're far apart. And you just speak normal like how we are right now. And you can hear them clearly across the way. Like they're far away. And it's just these two big satellites that are facing each other. There's so many ways we can communicate from a distance. Yeah, I found it. 
I found it interesting too because it was instead of the wires carrying your, your your voice, it's going through the earth. The earth. It is. Yeah. So, do you think it's electrical signals being distributed and also translated back to the speaker? I'm assuming there was a speaker and a microphone, or both of them were the same thing. Yeah, or, or uh, I know when he was showcasing, it was just a receiver, so they were able to um, hear him. But yeah. he had he had done experiments with his neighbor and his son to where just they were ways. able to talk to each other. Yeah, mm-hmm. cool. Yeah, because th- sorry, they also some people also consider him one of the first inventors of radio, but there's um, controversy regarding that. So, <laughs> hmm. so yeah, just it, they some people consider it some form of a of radio rather than. Um, I guess like a, a telephone. Yeah. Well, it sounds amazing how it travels. It does, right? I I was just like, this is incredible. Like, I don't understand why nothing came of this and or why nobody knows of knows of it, you know, or at least yeah. I didn't. Yeah, I didn't either. And I was just looking like, a, you know how Tesla was able, he wanted to, I guess, give electricity across the world, like just free electricity. And it brought me to an article and it was from a couple of years ago, but Disney was testing out some like they made a room and to where if you walk into the room, your phone starts to automatically charge through the air. It mm. could charge up to 10 phones or 10 devices. So it's not technology that ever went away. I think maybe it was just utilized in different ways that's not available to the public. Yeah, I'm still baffled that like. In places such as Texas, where we live, where we get so much sun, not every house has a solar panel on top. Yeah. <laughs> I hate to be like a conspiracy theorist or political in a history podcast, but there really is some form of um, when you mess with people's money, that becomes a problem. Yeah. And even though we look at it as like, oh, this is technology, this is cool. People who have that money don't see it that way. Yeah. And as we found out in the last episode, Texas is big on oil. Actually, it was in near Rockport, wasn't it? Where they had the big oil mm-hmm. discovery. And that's where this guy, my guy, Thomas Talley is from. So maybe that's why he was so involved in just electricity and forms of technology based off electricity. Because in that part of Texas, they had all of the oil. But yeah, it's very interesting. Like I, I, I'm always fascinated with like the way sound travels. Like right now I'm in a room yeah. and I have sponges everywhere and it absorbs sound. So I don't get echo acoustics or anything. But do you remember those um, the shoots for like, you know, like in a bank where you give them your card and all that? Yeah, when you go through the drive through Exactly. I don't know what you call those. I call them shoots. But we had one at a theater in Westlake, so when I mentioned earlier, and it had one in box office and it went all the way into the building through all these different, you know, turns and then into the upstairs office. And you mm-hmm. could speak into that shoot just normally and you could talk to someone in the office. Oh, wow. You didn't know that? No, I yeah, didn't. Yeah, we do that all the time. Uh, I don't know if you remember Daryl, but yeah, Daryl would like talk to us from box office through the shoot. And we would just hear his voice coming out the side of the wall. Yeah, so where they, where they would send money to the office for the safe. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah. yeah. I know what you're talking so about. the box office, they would have money and they would send it through the chute. And it would go up to the uh, the main office where they had the safe, get the money out. They would communicate through there every now and then. So, And it's just, they're so far apart. They're so far away because you can imagine the distance from the upstairs office in the theater, in the center of the theater, that building, all the way to the outside box office. I've always been fascinated with the way sound travels and the way sound works. So this was very different for me because I'm usually thinking of the vibrations and stuff, not the electrical signal placed into the ground and received from the ground. So good topic. Yeah, I was like, I was really shocked. I was like, I this is amazing. I've never heard of this. Anything else you want to add to your topic? Um, No, I think that about covers it. Cool, let's take a look at what else happened that year. Uh, on January 8th, there was a train collision in the New York Railway Park Avenue tunnel. Killed 17. The ty- Tyrannosaurus Rex bones are found in Montana, USA in 1902. Oh, I didn't finish mine. Killed 17, injures 38. <laughs> which back then was a lot of people. What about Tyrannosaurus Rex? What? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I'll just about to get to the, the fun details. And then, all right. <laughs> what were you saying about Tyr- I, I want to know what you're saying about <laughs> just that the, ter- the T-Rex bones were found in Montana, USA <laughs> on, on February 9th uh, fire levels 26 city blocks in New Jersey in Jersey City, New Jersey radium is isolated as a pure metal by Pierre and Marie Curie February 15th the Berlin U-Bahn underground is opened on Earth- sorry I'll <laughs> no, let go you ahead. go we'll take turns right <laughs> we're educating yeah. people as they're driving <laughs> 
and they're getting annoyed. Like, just tell me what happened. Earthquake in Guatemala and volcanoes erupt in St. Vincent, Japan and Nicaragua, killing thousands. Is that April 19th? I don't know what date. It's well, just it's 1902. I have a uh, Guatemala earthquake. That was uh, April 19th. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, May 20th, 1902, Cuba gains independence from the United States. Great Britain uh, signs alliance with Japan. Ooh. See if I can one up that one. Oh, the uh, the Philippine American War ends July second. I never knew it began. <laughs> and we'll end it on that, and we'll see you in 1903. See you in 1903. Bye. Bye. Bye.